grateful to have everyone here in the midst of this busy week and for those who are unfamiliar with what we do it's midweek bible study and thus it is a time in which between last first day of the week with the church assembles to worship god and the next the elders have decided in many congregations the lord's people to have a midweek bible study in which we have a devotional and a study of the bible I had several different thoughts as to what we might go into starting a new study this week. And uh, one kept reoccurring, and I decided, no, I wouldn't do it. I thought I'd do something else. But finally, I just decided that I wanted to do a study of the gospel account that the Apostle John wrote. And I would like for us to spend some time on that. So to begin with, with this study of the gospel according to John, John is clearly stating his proposition in the opening verse when he says, and the word was God. Notice the word was God, and he says, that word became flesh. Then he says, and dwelt among us, or among men, the apostles in particular. And then John proceeds to set forth the evidences. This is important to understanding how the book of John unfolds. He sets forth the evidences which prove his affirmations. You can allege a great many things, but alleging them, setting them out as propositions doesn't prove them. But John's book proves that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. So John intends that men use their reasoning powers question where did you get your power to reason where did you get your ability to come to the understanding of anything how is it that we can think and what is thinking well of course god created us and provided for us what we could not provide for ourselves you ever wonder why god made us reasonable why he gave us the powers of intellect. Yet he also made us uh, with free will. So I can choose to be stubborn or I can choose to be rebellious or I can choose to be reasonable. I can know whether I'm honest in my dealings with God and myself and with God's word. A good rule of thumb in God's dealing in understanding God's dealing with man is that God has done for us what we never could do for ourselves. But what we can do, he expects us, expects us to use whatever they may be to come to understanding his existence and all things pertaining to him, his will, and as it pertains to us. So John intends that all of us use our reasoning powers. Thus, he makes his affirmation, and the word was God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father. He intends us to weigh carefully, not haphazardly, not lightly, but very carefully, the evidences, now I want to underscore that word evidence or evidences. The evidences that he presents. And by the evidence presented by the Apostle John, be brought to a state of belief in Christ. Not just a mental affirmation that Jesus Christ lived 
but it is a confidence and a trust in him and whatever he teaches us. All of this is involved in why John wrote this book. In chapter 19 and verse 35, we actually have a purpose statement for the book. I think it's a beautiful purpose statement. You'll remember that John saw, with his own eyes we might say, one of the Roman soldiers take a spear and pierce the Lord's side. This was after, of course, his death. He was making sure he was dead. And we need to weigh carefully the evidences presented because these aren't just words to tell us about something and to be forgotten. He wanted these things to have an impact on us toward leading us to believe in Jesus Christ as the only begotten Son of God, who is, as he says in John chapter 14, verse 6, the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by him. So John sees the blood and water come from the Lord's side. It's interesting you would say blood and water. Of course, they don't have um, scientific terminology and certainly not the terminology of modern medical science. But somebody might say, well, I know the Lord was dead and he was good and dead and had been dead for a little while because the red blood cells are already separating from the plasma. And thus, when the spear entered up through his side, and we won't go into a study of the size of that particular spear blade or point, but it was a rather large one. Then the blood and water, blood and plasma came forth, showing he had already been dead for a while. Well, remember the Lord willed himself to die when he said to his father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. So John saw the blood and water come from the Lord's side. Now listen. And he that hath seen hath borne witness. And his witness is true. And he knoweth that he saith true. Why? That ye also may believe. Now we've just finished a study. Brief study. A fellowship. And we use the first chapter of the same apostles. First letter, First John, the study about fellowship. Now he told them, and they were Christians. These are people who already believed in Christ and from the heart obeyed the gospel. And he tells them he wants them to have the faith and fellowship with God that the apostles of Christ had with God. He said, that's why I'm writing to you. So John writes as an eyewitness. Now we use the word eyewitness, that's a bit redundant, but we do it to say you must be there and be able to experience with your eyes or your ears, one of the five senses, the very thing that you're speaking about. If not, then it's hearsay. Even in the courts of the land, if the whole court is populated by atheists, no one's going to let somebody get away in a court case with hearsay declarations. It, they'll rise with an objection and say that's hearsay, especially when it's a witness supposedly giving eyewitness testimony. So John writes as an eyewitness in absolute assurance of the truthfulness of his message. And he writes with a distinct purpose in mind what was it we've already said it really that those who read will also be brought to a saving belief in jesus christ of nazareth to be the son of god now we're familiar with john chapter 20 verses 30 and 31 and this is a tremendous purpose statement 
also. Many other signs therefore did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written. Why, John? That ye may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye may have life through his name. Let me pause here and remind you that through his name means by his authority. Not just to call out his name, but it's by his authority. Notice life. Life is to be had in the name of Christ or by the authority of Christ. And that is conditioned upon one's believing in him. This begins to tell us something about the nature of faith or its verb form, belief. Believing is produced by proper consideration of adequate evidence. I know that great many people who are atheists, if not all of them, will try to talk about a leap of faith. By that, they mean the only way that you can come to certitude or absolute knowledge about anything would be through your five senses, such as examining something through experiments in a laboratory or looking through a microscope or a telescope. You've got to experience with your five senses. It must be in the present when you do that and so on. But when you notice believing, then we're talking about it not being something that is a leap of faith as those kinds of people I just mentioned define it. Believing, believing or belief or faith is based on adequate evidence and credible witnesses. Our whole court system knows that. If you have a jury, they have a court case and they're sitting in that case. They're going to render a decision based on what? On the laws that govern it, as well as the presentation of evidence and testimony of witnesses. And they must be credible witnesses. And when the evidence is in, and the preponderance of it, that is the weight of it, comes down on the side of you're guilty, then without ever any one of those who are on the jury experiencing a thing the person charged with the crime did firsthand, as we might say, they will render their verdict. And as I say, if the evidence and testimony comes down on the side of you're guilty, they will render, if all's done as it's supposed to be done, a guilty verdict. Well, that's not a leap of faith. And that's all that John's doing. That's all any of the apostles did, is offer eyewitness testimony that Jesus Christ of Nazareth not only lived in human form on this earth, but that he was whom he claimed to be, the Son of God, the way, the truth, the life, and that no man comes to the Father but by him, John 14, 6. Now, John, by inspiration, because all of the writers of the Bible were inspired of the Holy Spirit, to write infallibly what they wrote. And he has carefully selected and carefully recorded seven distinct, let me say that again, seven, seven distinct signs as partial but conclusive evidence. And that's important for us to recognize. Many other signs Jesus did. But John, by direction of the Holy Spirit, 
infallibly selected these signs. He did this in the presence of, that is our Lord, did this in the presence of witnesses. What did he do in the presence of witnesses? Signs. Let me talk about sign for a moment. S-I-G-N or plural with the S on it. A miracle is a sign. If we really understand the miracles that Jesus did, their purpose, the reason that he did them, is because there are signs that he is no mere human being, but that he is the incarnate word. That's what a sign does. We don't focus in on the sign, but we see what it refers us to and what it means, in this case, about Jesus Christ. So there were many signs not written in this book that John wrote. So we know the Lord did many signs that are not recorded. But John says, what I wrote to you was written to convince you that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So the book is therefore distinctly apologetic in its nature. Apologetic in its nature. Now I would like to, if you want to jot these down, that's up to you, but I'd like to suggest the following as pretty much a natural outline of the book of John. There's the introduction, some might call it the prologue. Chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. Chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. There's the Lord's revelation of himself to the world. Chapter 1, verse 19. All the way through chapter 12 and verse 50. Chapter 1, verse 19 all the way through chapter 12 and verse 50. Now, what is that? Those uh, verses cover the Lord's revelation of himself to the world. Chapter 119 through chapter 12, verse 50. And the last three main divisions of the Gospel of John is the Lord's revelation of himself to his disciples. The Lord's revelation of himself to his disciples. That's chapters 13 through 20. Chapters 13 through 20. The Lord's revelation of himself to his disciples. And then if you lack of a better way to refer to it, the last chapter, chapter 21, you might call it the epilogue or you might call it an appendix, chapter 21. So we have the prologue introduction. We have the Lord's revelation of himself to the world, the Lord's revelation of himself to his disciples, and then the epilogue or ep appendix. That's a basic ba breakdown, um, outline, I guess you'd call it, of the book of John. Now, one thing to notice about the book of John is that the apostle makes no effort to follow the chronological sequence of the Lord's personal ministry. Now, remember, he's being guided by the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. And under that guidance, the influence of the Spirit, he thinks about, that is the apostle John, thinks about various areas of evidences. Let me say that again. He thinks about various areas of evidences that Jesus is the Son of God. And he gathers and he selects materials to record them that are related to these specific areas that he has in mind. So we want to pursue the study of the book by the outline I've given you and see if we can systematically approach the book 
and be able to remember it maybe better this way than we would otherwise. First of all, we go back to the introduction, or as I called it also, the prologue, chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. Now, I'm not going to read all of that. You can read it with me. And by the way, I'll pause here and say, if you have any questions about anything that I don't deal with, write it down and let me know, and we'll try to deal with it. But we'll begin here with the epilogue, chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. Of course, the Apostle John's referring to the Word. Referring to the Word, first of all, as to time. Interesting that even in the beginning, he already existed. And had been existing before the beginning. And why is that the case? Because he's God and God doesn't have a beginning or ending. Verse 14 of John 1 makes it clear then that the word of John 1, 1 and 2 became a human being, a tabernacle in the flesh. The Greek word, pain, two-letter word, imperfect tense. Imperfect tense means what? It means continuous, continuous action in time past. In other words, back there in the beginning, Christ was and is the great I am and functioned in the beginning. You see, there's a time, and notice my words are limited, when time began. There's a point in eternity when time and space and material things began. And we'll talk about that maybe a little more later. Now, as to designation, I've already referred you to this several times. You knew, mo most of you knew about it anyway. Then Christ is called the Word. Ho Logos. This is Word, the, the, this is the, the Word, we'll say it that way that is behind any study of thought, of preparation, of reasoning. I have one particular logic book. Since logos is the root of logic, then the writer talking about logic just immediately puts it in there with the, with in the beginning was the word. In the beginning was the logos. In the beginning was logic. In the beginning was reasoning. In the beginning was understanding. And that's the point he makes all through his little work on logic. So this relationship that he has was with the Father. Notice with God. But I think there's more to it sometimes than we realize here. When it says with God, this is more than just being present with God. It involves working with. It involves interaction with. But I pause here quickly and say it's not like two people working together. Not at all. Because we're talking about the one God in three persons. That is the one eternal essence of deity is composed of three persons. And the second person is the Hologos, the Word. The Word was characterized by the very nature and essence of of deity and this this is the point that john's making now when you take people like jehovah's witnesses and certain others they don't translate this that way in fact they don't translate it they write their doctrine into it they have what they call the new world translation it's their own translation and wherein it needs to say what their doctrine is they conveniently change that 
But what I've given you is just exactly what the Greek text has to say. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In verse 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. Glory is of the only begotten of the Father. Now, as to the whole logos or the Word's relationship to the physical world, then all things came into being by or through him. And apart from him, nothing came into being. Here's what you really have, and the Greek construction makes this clear. Jesus Christ is the indirect agency as the pre-incarnate word. God was the direct agent, that is, the Father, Christ, is the indirect agent. Yet that tells us that each person of the Godhead, though they are the same essence, thus the same nature, they each work to make the whole work. So when the Holy Spirit does something, God did it. When Jesus did it, God did it. And when the Father did it, God did it because they are of that one divine essence. As to the relationship to the moral world, John says in him was life, and the life which was and is the light of men. As to the power of the moral light from him, Notice that the light shines in darkness, in the darkness. And the darkness comprehended it not, uh, or overpower, did not overpower it. Darkness can't overpower light. Error cannot over, ultimately and finally overpower truth. The darkness of a world could not and cannot overcome the light from Jesus Christ. And light is always used to refer to truth and darkness to error and wickedness and such things, false whatever and lies. Now, moving on with John. John takes us now to someone called John the baptizer, John the immerser. Why was this man, John the immerser, called John the immerser? Because he ran around immersing folks. <laughs> and all you have to do is read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and read about the forerunner of the Christ. The man sent ahead of the Christ to the Jews to get them to get ready to receive their Messiah, the Son of God. And if you look at Mark chapter 1 and verse number 4, he preached a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Now, that's what he preached to the Jews to get them ready for the Christ. Well, what were they to repent of? They approached God under the law of Moses, not the New Testament, not the gospel. They had to repent of their sins under the law, believe the message John the baptizer preached that the Messiah is coming, that he is at hand, that his kingdom is at hand, and then be baptized for the remission of sins. That's the point of Mark 1, verse 4. And notice that John the baptizer came into being He's a man. He was born, with count of which he found in the scriptures. But here's the point I want to make. He was sent from God. God planned on this. God knew this would be. Read the last part of Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament. You'll see there would be one who would precede the coming of the Messiah. And then all those hundreds of years later, here he comes in the fullness of time, Paul said, Galatians 4 and verse 4. 
so they would be the forerunner. Now, that may sound strange to us, but back in those days when they didn't know anything but monarchs or emperors or whatever, then whenever the monarch would be coming into a place, there would be those who would be sent before him to get the people ready for the king to come. Even today, uh, our president, whomever he may be, or she may be, who knows, when he goes somewhere, there's a great entourage of making sure everybody knows his schedule and people appear several days before and get everything done just so-so and whatever and protection and all that kind of thing. Not quite maybe the same as it was when there was a forerunner of a king in those ancient days, but sort of accomplishing the same thing. So John came basically and said to the Jews, your king's coming. And he was sent, that is, John the Baptist, John the Baptizer. He was sent by God on a special message. Or I should say, with a special message, a special assignment. Notice again, his name's John. And this man came for a witness. For a witness. First of all, it says that he may bear witness of the light that all might believe through him. He was not that light, but he came to bear witness of the light. Now this leads John, the apostle who's writing this, into a discussion of the true light. So there is a true light. And this true light's coming into the world to enlighten every person every man and the scripture says he was in the world and the world was made through him in direct agent and the world didn't know him he came into his own he came right into his own creation actually and those who were his own did not receive him I'd like to talk about that just for a moment. I think I referred to it sometime recently. But imagine the executive of the Father's will who back in eternity, for lack of a better way to put it, in eternity before time, space, and matter was created, created this whole cosmos, created a world, and in that world created a garden, and there's no sin at all to corrupt it. We all know the account in Genesis of Adam and Eve and how Eve was beguiled and caused to sin by eating the fruit that God had forbade them to eat and gave to her husband, he did eat, and thus sin entered the world. And death or separation from God by sin, for sin is the transgression of the law. First John chapter 3, verse 4. And when we look at this, we're able to see that our Lord then, when he came into the world as the incarnate word, when he became flesh, when he became a human being, he put himself into the same world we're in, a world that has fallen, a world where Satan has access to all of us, where sin dwells, where the Bible says all things are dominated by the wicked one. And thinking as we would think, why should the Lord do that? I made them a perfect place. I gave them what they are, and they ruined it. And now I'm expected to go down and go through all of this to save them from the mess they made themselves. There's a song we sing sometimes, Oh, love that will not let me go. And thus that ties in with the love that God has for us. A love that gives, a love that seeks our own good when we don't even believe in him. Right now, the person trying to disprove the existence of God, who opposes the deity of Christ, who denies the plenary verbal inspiration 
of the scriptures, that they're not holy, that they're not sacred. Jesus still died for them on the cross of Calvary. Shed his blood for the remission of their sins and all men's sins. So while this world goes on, it's quite obvious that God is exercising his long suffering because of his great love for you and for me and for all men to give us the opportunity to use the mind he gave us and the intellect he gave us and the reasoning powers that he gave us to take in the evidence of that proves that Christ is the Son of God. So his own didn't receive him when he came, but to those who did receive him, to them gave he the power or the right to become children of God, even those who believed upon him. Now that's an important point to make there. The believer in Christ as the Son of God and Savior of the world, when he's reached that stage intellectually, he only has the right to become. He's not already one. The whole denominational world round about us says the moment you believe Christ is the Son of God and you say, Lord, come into my heart, you're saved. The only problem with that is the Bible doesn't teach it, and that's enough. That's what most people in denominational churches believe, but the Bible does not teach it. And remember, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. So those who are brought to belief in Christ, correctly brought to belief in Christ by the adequate evidence, credible witnesses, only then given the right to become, they're not already, but they have the right to become the sons of God. That's why in the Great Commission that Mark's account gives us, Mark 16, 15, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. So one must be brought to belief, but it doesn't begin and end there. And is baptized. Now, that's exactly what Peter told those people on the day of Pentecost when they were brought to belief in Christ by the evidence presented by the apostles in their preaching and the signs of the miracles done on them on that day. And he told them as believers to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, Acts 2, verse 38. And verse 41 says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. Now, my point here is this. Nowhere does God ask you to just accept what he says without proving he is that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is his only begotten son and the only savior of the world and that the Bible is the infallible, inerrant, all-sufficient, final, and complete revelation of God to man. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 and James 1, 25. God has given us the ability to think and to reason and to take in the facts and to know what they lead us to by honest reasoning and thinking. Thus, this is how John approaches us in his gospel account. Well, our time's about gone, so I think we'll have to stop here, and we will continue on, the Lord willing, next time we have our class, and we'll be able to study this. But before we go, would you bow with me for a word of prayer? O holy and righteous Father, we come before thy throne, hallowing thy name and thanking thee for our time together in the midst of this busy week. Time is fleeting and we come closer to eternity every breath we take. And we pray, Father, that we'll use our time on earth to learn thy truth, to learn about Jesus, to learn the importance of preparing for the day we leave this world for eternity. Help us to so receive the word and let it lead us and guide us and direct us that we might understand spiritual things correctly, that we might understand the very purpose of our life on earth in the flesh. Go with us, Father, and bless thy church throughout the world. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the glory and the power forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen.